и добре дошли отново. Дами и господа, обикновено, като говорим за наука и се вглеждаме в бъдещето, имаме склонността, поне ние от рацио и на нашите събития, предимно да говорим за позитивните сценарии, за това как ще се случат нещата, говорим за технологии, които ще ни удължат живота. Общо взето имаме една така визия за това, че бъдещето изглежда сравнително добре. Ние поне повечето сме оптимисти. От друга страна, смятаме, че е необходимо да погледнем и за това как нещата могат да се объркат. Знаеме чисто исторически, човечеството има склонността да натиска бутона на технологии, които не сме сигурни точно как работят. И нямаме никаква причина да смятаме, че това поведение ще се промени в близкото бъдеще. Затова решихме да си поговорим малко за антиутопиите и за това как ние, използвайки науката по начини, по които не разбираме добре, можем да се окажем в едно общество, което е доста по-неприятно и така неочаквано от това, което по принцип сме си мислили, че ще се получи. Поканали сме няколко човека днес да дискутират тази тема. Панелът е изключително интересен. Искам да започна с Питър Лотс. Питър Лотс е морски биолог, но всъщност по-интересната част от биографията му, че той е писател в фантастия и носител на наградата Хуго. Две от книгите му са издавани в България. Едната от тях е слепоглед. Характерно за него е, че има малко по-мрачен тон. И също така, че в неговите романи имаме чисто научна библиография. Той прави референции директно към научни статии. Поля да посрещнем с аплодисменти Питър Лоц. Питър. Welcome. Вторият ни панелист е Гили Рон. Тя е архитект, алгоритмичен дизайнер и творец. Тя изследва функционалностите на дизайна и употребата на инновативни технологии в архитектурните практики. Гили, пожалуйста, welcome on stage. Също от Израел наш гост е Урия Вив, който е основател и генерален директор на Utopia Association, както и на едноименния годишен фестивал, международен фестивал за научна фантастика и фантастични филми в Тел-Авив. Ури, please welcome on stage. И разбира се, за мен е удоволствие за втори път, сигурен съм, че и за много от вас ще е приятно, за втори път да покане на сцената Мартин Модер. Мартин. Дами и господа, аплодисменти за нашият панел. Two decades of the last century as a marine biologist, and I spent the first two decades of this century as a science fiction writer, which basically means I throw a lot of darts at the future, and every now and then, by absolute random chance, one of them hits a bullseye, and when that happens, people like Lubo think, "Wow, this guy's an expert on on the neurology of consciousness," and he hauls me across the Atlantic to give a talk on something that I'm really not very expert at. And that happened in 2017, and apparently I didn't offend enough people, so he's brought me back. Good for us. Um, I am Gilly Ron. I'm very excited to be here. I'm also surprised that you are here, like Rick and Morty is out today. What are you doing here, Gilly? What? <laughs> what? Yes. <Fuck. laughs> I think we can wrap this up in 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm an architect, and I find myself um, drawn into the weirder side of architecture that have to do with um, using cutting-edge technology in design and fabrication. Um, so everything that has to do with AR, VR, robotic fabrication, and digital design and simulation, in a nutshell. Yes, I'm Martin Moda. I'm a molecular biologist. I'm interested in human optimization. Uh, I myself mostly worked on human disease. I, for example, did brain tumor research on fruit flies, um, which works far better than it sounds. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm also part of a science comedy group, although um, I'm not the funny one. We outsourced that part to an actual comedian. Um, <laughs> Who's doing a way better job? But it's um, yeah, I also enjoyed quite a bit. We enjoyed your talk. 
Um, once again, my name is Uwe Aviv. Um, I'm from Tel Aviv. Um, I'm an artistic director, a project manager, and I deal with events that, cultural events that intertwine science, technology, uh, innovation, space, anything that's really cool, uh, that I think is cool. Um, and um, my first and foremost love is science fiction, and uh, I guess one of the things that brought me here, aside of Peter's recommendation, uh, is, um, is a project we've started doing at Utopia, which is the festival I direct in Tel Aviv, um, uh, that has to do with future storytelling, how we perceive, how we tell, how we imagine the future. Um, that's how some of us got together. And, um, we had a number of preliminary discussions towards this panel on what exactly we should talk about, what are the disasters and cataclysms we would like to explore in this panel. Uh, so genetics at CRISPR emerged, resurrection of long gone disease, mega pandemics due to antibiotics resistance or biowarfare, AI, robotics, automation, killer drones, nanomaterials, nanotechnology, and of course, climate change. Um, but through the talks and discussions we had, a few more meta topics kind of emerged. And we all decided to go with them, actually. And don't worry, you'll hear about AI and climate change and killer drones. Um, each of us brought, a s brought an idea uh, to the stage, a topic, uh, we'll, which we will present in an introductory kind of talk, an impulse for a conversation. Now, it might seem like that, but I'm not a moderator or a referee, so if you guys start you know, a fight, I'm not going to stop that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to try and make sure each uh, of the topics receives its full potential or full time. So that's my role here, I guess. And um, by Tommy Cost, no, by, by, um, by seniority, we decided Peter would go first. Yeah, by seniority, he means I happened to get my time zones mixed up and I, uh, didn't, <laughs> I wasn't in on the Skype conversation which they decided who was going to go first. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, I guess we're going to start with something a little bit meta. My, uh, of course, climate change is sort of the, the environmental disaster of, of the week and, and with, with good cause, but it's only one of a huge host of injuries we are inflicting on the planet. Uh, it's only responsible for a very, very small part of the fact that we've wiped out 60% of the world's wildlife since the 1970s, that we've wiped out 47% of the world's wild ecosystems in that time. Um, there was a very real threat of nuclear annihilation back before climate change. We've started noticing climate change. If we somehow managed to pull out of the nosedive that we're currently in with climate change, there could be a hard AI takeoff. There could be a Grey Goo nanotech scenario. Uh, the common thread to all this stuff is us. So the th what, I, what I've been exploring in my, in my thinking and my writing lately is that it's not so much the world that needs fixing as we do. Um, we are basically doing what you would expect, something with a 50,000-year-old out-of-date brain built to fucking fight on some African savanna would do when it gets its hands on world-changing technology. And it seems to me that perhaps the best way, the only way, if, no matter what proximate catastrophes we manage to find our way out of, we should probably come up with some way of fixing ourselves or we'll just create another existential threat down the road. I had some ideas as to how we might do that, but I do not think I'm going to say them now because because Martin is on the panel and he will point out how absolutely full of bullshit they are. Say it so I can point it out. <laughs> <laughs> if at some point in the panel you say Terminator, I would love that, by the way. Terminator, as in the Thanks. genes? Or I forgot the baby oil. I'm, I'm not going to do it without. What? Um, what? I missed what? the question. So coming back to the problem of... Uh, you know, are you talking about biologically changing our capacity for mayhem? Or are you talking like, op, you know, um, scenarios where you would have a cultural change, like a new religion that actually makes a lot of sense, um, that, you know, keeps people from performing terrible tasks uh, or, or 
that, that first thinking? thing. I think there's so many religions on the planet now that if we popped up with another one, the other ones would probably unite and try and squash it like a bug. I think that niche space is... No fun. risk, no fun, though. I, I, think, right. <laughs> I think we may, we may be in a situation where um, I, there are two ways of doing it. One is through fear, and I think we can use disease for that, Zika in particular. But I think a, a longer-term fix might be to basically allow us to stay on the diet. It's really, really difficult to stay on a diet if you're hungry all the time. It's really, really difficult to live sustainably if millions of years of natural selection have programmed you to constantly consume all you can in the moment and to breed and to, you know, squash the other guy. If you can actually, I've written a couple of stories where people actually, you know, we can sort of hack the, the midbrain so that people actually get off on doing environmentally sustainable things. <laughs> um, you basically, when you ejaculate by going vegan, you're going to have a lot more people <laughs> giving up meat. Um, <laughs> until that point, we can actually infect everybody with a, a type of allergy spread by a, a particular kind of tick, which sends you into anaphylactic shock when you eat meat. But that's a short-term solution. Um, I, I'm thinking in these terms, you could actually use some of your adenoviruses yeah. Um, and retroviruses to, to um, reprogram certain things that actually already exist. People with Parkinson's disease are less religious than other people. If we could somehow tweak a variant of Parkinson's that leaves the rest of the brain alone but continues to suppress the religious impulse, <coughs> we would make our species less congenitally evil right there. Um, if you lesion the ventromedial prefrontal cortex of people in certain ways, you will, you will change them so that a parent would gladly abandon one of their children to burn in a building if that meant that they could save two or three strangers' children. These people aren't sociopaths. They're, they've got a, a very strong sense of right and wrong, and it's a better sense of right and wrong than most of us have because it's based on rational ethics, um, not gut morality. Um, so these people would actually sacrifice their own fitness for the greater good, which is something that would never take off under Darwinian selection, but which is something that would probably stand us in really good stead in the long term if we could somehow figure out a way of tweaking our neural circuitry in a similar way without having to resort to surg surgical lesions. Yeah, you can jump in and tell me I'm full of shit any time now. All of you can. So well, I'm talking about behavioral <laughs> change. <laughs> behavioral change, but are you talking about um, changing neural pathway? Are you talking about neural change or genetic change? And, okay, so and which type of change will you do? Well, I, I, I would argue that's, um, that's a very blurred distinction. You use okay. the genetics. I mean, it's not, like, it's not like the genes contain a circuit diagram for the brain. What the genes basically do is say, glial cells start migrating, glial cells stop migrating, and a lot of the other stuff, the developmental stuff, sort of happens as a result of physical interactions. Again, stop me if I'm wrong. My background is in yeah, marine bi biology, so I'm probably... Definitely not going to stop this. Okay. And you'll <laughs> but, but, but you'll do this to the current generation or to the next generation? Well, once you, once you get into the germline cells, um, it, 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 will, it will be heritable. But you could also do it, even if it didn't get into the germline cells, by just having something ubiquitous in the air, some kind of a, an airborne anthrax variant or something. So this, this doesn't like sound like saving the world, actually. It sounds like the opposite, what you're proposing. You know? Well, it depends on what you call the world. Yeah, that's true. I mean, if you think, if you think of the world as the biosphere that we're wiping out, then yeah. I would imagine that a world without us would be saved. But if you want to talk about making humans more sustainable, yeah. I would argue that... the We've tried stoicism. We've tried, to, we've tried data. We've tried presenting data. I mean, there's never been a more compelling case for cutting back on our carbon emissions, and people still aren't willing to spend the price of two lattes a month <laughs> to fight climate change. Yeah, um, yeah. So maybe what we need now is some Heath Leather, Ledger Joker type with his own basement biohacking kit to come up with something that will, that will hack us and make us less intrinsically evil. Yeah, can so but one? lethal? Um, can I ask an answer to this one? So what you're proposing kind of relates to, um, to your previous talk in talking about optimization. But there's an inherent problem with optimization. First of all, whenever we're talking about it, we're 
describing a kind of model, and model is always simplified. You can't see all of complexity of existence within the model. And provided we are going in that direction, how would you know that your proposed optimization, and I'm putting aside the let's kill all humankind, yeah. just for a second <laughs> we'll get there. Um, <laughs> But how would you know? Suppose there's a new epidemic coming around and that one gene that you just eliminated could be the possible best fitted result for that case. If we're trying to optimize humankind, how, based on your agenda, us and silly humans, how would we know what's best? What's how? up to it? Yeah. yeah, I agree. The, the question I would ask you then is how do we know that wiping out 130,000 species a year is best. We're already doing that. Um, I think what you're, what you're running the risk of doing here is making um, the disastrous the enemy of the absolutely apocalyptic. I think we're already in free fall. And to say, well, it may not be time for product testing and, and risk assessment. It may be time for a Hail Mary. I mean, that 130,000 species, I got that from the Natural Museum of History in Tel Aviv, that real-time ticker, right? That, that kicked the hell out of me. I thought we were like closer to 70 or 80,000 species. Um, so, so it was like, yeah, there are no guarantees, but what are we doing now? It's not like we have a stable, sustainable system now that we don't dare screw with. We are, we are pulling the rivets off the wings of a plane that's already, you know, at 30,000 feet. And it might be time to try something radical because, hell, the UN, even now, the UN couldn't agree on a single target, a single binding target for, for climate change mitigation just this last summer. And this was after the 2018 IPCC report came out, which said basically our our best case scenario now is worldwide disaster, and that hinges on creating unicorn technology that does not exist yet. Um, and that's after subsequent reports have found that the IPCC report was, was childishly and naively optimistic. Just last week, or maybe the week before, Nature Communications put out a paper saying, guess what, guys? We underestimated the amount of flooding that's going to occur worldwide as a result, uh, as a result of climate change by a factor of three. It's going to be triple the inundation, we thought. Um, at what point do you say, you know something, we've just got to try anything? So, uh, I want to be a bit of a devil's advocate um, and uh, comment with something very personal. Um, so my dad uh, went through the Holocaust. He's a Holocaust survivor. And one of the things I've learned through my dad is, and uh, it's a common, um, it's, it's common knowledge, it's not something, I'm bringing it something very personal, but human, the human mind, the human body, and human society are extremely flexible. So, I would claim to you, for good and bad, that there are going to be humans on the face of the planet in 200, 300, 400, 500 years. There may be less. I don't know what type of society they'll have. I'm not sure if it's better or worse, it, it, uh, but we can define better or worse, I guess, in terms of life expectancy or infant mortality. But we, I don't believe in the, in the, apocalypse, in the complete apocalyptic scenarios. Yeah, me neither. I, yeah, we, we are too much of a pest species to, to be completely eradicated. But if you want, if you get the kind of person who gets off on playing Xbox, or on convenient microwavable food, <laughs> stuff your face and, and load down everything you can from steam now, because in about 20 years, I think that stuff might, the infrastructure for that stuff might be crumbling. Hmm. Actually, um, maybe you don't even need to uh, change <coughs> biology. I just remembered, I think it was mentioned, I didn't read the study, but it was written, uh, written in one of the books of uh, Harari, this uh, historian. Um, he described those cases of, he called it- bring him up later on. So. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, let's see. Lies, deception. <laughs> but, um, so he wrote about what is called the robo-rats, and, and basically what they did is they stuck um, some, you know, um, electrodes in the brains of rats um, to stimulate their reward system. And uh, by doing this, they could basically decide what feels satisfying to the rat. So, they managed to train the rats to do things that rats would usually never do, like jump off a high cliff, 
that they survive, but it hurts. It's not fun. And, and it's not that they forced those people, uh, those mice or rats, whatever, <laughs> some rodents, <laughs> some I'm mammals. So nature, they didn't, <laughs> they, it's not like they, f they forced them, but the rats, they wanted to do this. This is what they got the most pleasure from. And there are even studies uh, with, you know, electromagnetic stimulation, where you see that you can influence the behavior of people in a way that they don't feel remote controlled, but you can, to a certain degree, pick and choose what they actually want without them feeling forced. So maybe if you say, yeah, we must get people to get off and on, on, on becoming vegan or, or, or something ecologically friendly, I think theoretically, without tweaking genetics, there would be ways to do this. Well, if you can convince 7.6 billion people to wear transcranial magnetic stimulation helmets, that would make things easier. Just don't um, ask, the, just do it. The, the idea of, of the, the rats with the, the dopamine transmission, that's, that's fascinating stuff. And I just recently discovered myself that dopamine is not actually a pleasure mo molecule at all. It's just this motivation molecule. Yeah, dopamine is basically seeking. greed. It's the search for rewards. It is the, the molecule that makes you look for more stuff. And that's why people on Facebook and people playing the slot machines are so fucking miserable. You know, they're getting dopamine delivery just from every little blob of red that, that sort of appears on your Facebook screen if you've had the temerity to sign out of Facebook for a moment. But, but it's not... It doesn't give you pleasure, but it addicts you. There's another molecule called nociceptin that's, uh, that's sensitive. They've just discovered it, I think, last July, I read in this paper. Nociceptin is, was not discovered last July. It does a whole bunch of things. It's a neuropeptide. But in this last paper in July, what they discovered is it's kind of like the anti-greed molecule. If, if dopamine is search for more stuff, Nociceptin is basically, fuck it, I'm giving up. I've had enough. And if the, the receptors, and this was done in rodents, so who knows, but, but uh, the receptors for that ha occur in the ventral tegmental area. And that was something else I was thinking that we could do. If, we could, if you could trick the brain into producing extra nociceptin, we could stop being greedy. And an advantage of nociceptin is that it is... Uh, associated with depression. And depression, people who are depressed are actually more objective and more realistic about situations with unknown variables. We, we, we describe it as a pathology, but that's because healthy humans are programmed to be delusionally optimistic. Um, and I think there's nothing, there's no more scathing indictment of the whole hope punk movement. And we, we have to give people hope and we, we, we can't let people give into despair. The people amongst us who are empirically and testably and re replicatably more objective than we are, we describe as victims of a pathology. And that's why there's a movement afoot now to have de clinical depression reclassified as depressive realism. <laughs> <laughs> so you're positively reinforcing your own depression. That's for one wonderful. <laughs> and many people around. Um, I think uh, this is a good segue, maybe. <laughs> to some of what you, were want, you wanted to talk about. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, so to continue on this very high note, I read something lately that was very interesting to me. So the topic is epigenetics, a subset of biology uh, that has to do with the relationship between genotype and phenotype. So once you are formed as a human and you start progressing, you receive your uh, 23 and 23 chromosomes in you know, a, a regular state, let's say, um, to form what would later become a human being. Um, so epigenetics is not how DNA uh, is uh, changed, because the DNA stays the same, but rather, if to use an analogy from, from computer science world, it's your metadata. It tells you when to turn on and turn off specific genes. Now, this is super interesting in relating to cancer studies, for example, but another uh, recently discovered effect of it, it's it, um, the sociological and psychological effects uh, that are linked with it. In other words, saying the psychological effects you will experience during your lifetime would eventually affect which of your genes would come to play in your phenotype. 
how is that depressing? So, if you're, exper <laughs> if you're experiencing um, post-traumatic syndrome, for example, when you're exposed to extreme trauma and you experience it again and again until it becomes this reoccurring mental state, you don't only feel it during your lifetime, you're bound to hereditarily Trust give it to, to your offsprings. So at first, when people started studying this, they thought, okay, let's look at, for example, Holocaust survivors. And then they figured, okay, so um, children of Holocaust survivors might suffer from PTSD because they're acting like their parents. But actually, um, their epigenome is changed. They're more prone to trauma, to depression, uh, to suicidal thoughts. This is not the only case, by the way. So other cases, like uh, um, experiencing violence, being molested, what have you, terrible effects. So we're not only messing with our biological environment, we're not only wrecking up our natural resources, we're creating these damages that stay with us mentally and genetically to us, to the next generation. How, how did they distinguish between... <laughs> How did they distinguish between um, effects that were actually inherited epigenetically and those that, were, that would naturally accrue from somebody being raised as the child of Holocaust survivors who might sort of be kind of downers to be with in the first place? Like, there must be a... <coughs> so, when you're talking about epigenetics, you're basically talking about um, um, the tags, like the chemical tags that are added to your, uh, to your DNA and say, turn on and turn off. And those, those can't be affected just by, by, Experiences. by growing up? Yes. So how do we know that these things were passed on epigenetically as opposed to reinduced in the next generation um, because of environmental factors? So there are other studies that indicate you can actually change your, um, your mental state and your physical state with doing positive things, like um, meditation, for example, which alters your... It, um, arguably your brain structure at some point. Um, so you have this one and you have that one. I hope I answered your question. And also to add to that, it's a relatively new research field, the way I just defined it. I feel yeah, like you should Maybe I can it. add something to that too. Yes. It's, it's actually very difficult to distinguish if you find epigenetics modifications in children, uh, whether this was somehow, you know, propagated from the parents to the children by uh, maybe some special behavior, but there are ways to figuring it out. And, and, and in, in, in epigenetics, it helps a lot if you find the mechanism um, that evoked this response. Uh, this is best studied in animals, again, uh, I think some kind of rodents, mice. So there was this one study, I think it's one of the most fascinating epigenetic studies I've ever, ever read about. Um, they took those mice, right, or rats, doesn't matter. Let's say it was mice. And uh, they exposed them to a certain sweet smell, which is a nice thing to do in an animal experiment, but then they shocked them electrically, <laughs> always <laughs> immediately, right? Um, and they did this again and again until the mice experienced fear the moment they smelled this sweet sense, uh, this smell, right? Now, so for rats or mice, we're ve fairly sure that they don't tell your children whenever you smell something sweet, run away, right? They can't pass this on culturally, right? But the children of those mice, when they were, the ones where the parents were shocked, when they smelled this smell, they also exhibited some kind of fear response. But this was not true for the ones where the parents did not shock. And it even went into the third generation, and maybe even in the fourth, I'm, I'm not sure. And <laughs> <laughs> but, but they actually figured out how this happened because there's a receptor, a, a specific receptor for this kind of smell and this one got upregulated specifically in the brains of um, those rats whose parents were exposed to this smell. And, uh, and somehow this was connected with the fear response. I'm not exactly certain about, uh, about this background. But, but the thing is, in rodents, we can show it very nicely. In plants, it's even there's no doubt about it. In humans, it's, 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 it's fairly hard to do good studies, but there are some, as the ones with the Holocaust survivors, as some studies with famines, where you've seen it, mm. 
where they can show it and they can even show what the modifications are that get passed on uh, epigenetically. The problem is that we can sequence the genome since quite a while. Sequencing the epigenome properly, we can only do since a few years and not even completely at this point because epigenetics is a collection of various forms of modification, so either directly on the DNA or on the proteins that the DNA are wrapped around or just RNA fragments uh, covering parts of the DNA and so on. Um, but they're starting to understand this. They're very certain that it also happens in humans, but we don't even know what all the effects are. So it's absolutely possible. Fear response is fairly easy to study in comparison. But it's possible uh, that there are way more responses, not, in, not only trauma, that can be passed on. But uh, yeah, so I, I, it's a super interesting field. If, if yeah. one wants to become a geneticist, uh, there's a lot of knowledge to, to find. Do, do we have pass on anything on? good? I don't know. I do. <laughs> <laughs> to have another point on that topic, just imagine media, public media, news, entertainment, the things that stay with us, the things that seep into our dreams, the things we, we contemplate on, uh, positive messages as opposed to negative. We all know that negative messages sell a lot more. You know, It's more delicious to dive into the terrible things. And this is what sells a newspaper, right? You don't open a newspaper and hear about a wonderful story <laughs> that just happened. Like, uh, you know that... Um, stand-up skit about a wonderful drug story. Nobody tells that. <laughs> they, 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 it's non-related, but there are very good ones. Um, but in other words, saying, we keep sustaining ourselves with terrible messages and terrible news. Right? Yes. There, it's going to cater to the, next part of the up, yeah. uh, to the next part of the conversation. Because if, if this panel had been utopias, what a wonderful uh, future we're going to have. Uh, I don't know. Would it be as um, interesting to the audience? I don't know. <laughs> My that point being, by feeding ourselves mm -hmm. with so much terrible information, we're jamming up generations to come. We're not even given thought of that. I would like to play devil's advocate for a bit here, because there's what you're basically talking about, there's a body of research um, about something called the human negativity bias. Mm. Right. So it's not just an attempt to sell more newspapers, it's that we are coded, and it's easy to see why it would be shaped this way, we are coded to pay more attention to bad news and to learn more from bad news than from good news. Uh, you can all see the evolutionary advantage in that. But at the same time, um, though we, spend, we pay more attention to bad news, we are delusionally optimistic because, like some guy on Reddit, is one of my favorite quotes, says, you know, everybody fantasizes about being Mad Max Nobody fantasizes about being one of the skulls piled up in the background. <laughs> um, so even facing apocalypse, we somehow figure that we're going to be the badass that survives. And I think, I think this, I think that there's something really pernicious about that. We must maintain an upbeat, um, upbeat attitudes. Guillermo del Toro went on a Time magazine just a few months ago saying that hope is the radical option. That's bullshit. Hope is the default option. We are so programmed for delusional optimism that it threatens our survival. We simply can't internalize long-term destructive consequences if it means we have to slightly lower our standard of living today. So what you're talking about is a real phenomenon, but it also happens in partnership with this weird denial. They, they just discovered, actually just a couple of weeks ago, a paper came out where they literally discovered a denial circuit in the brain that basically throws your brain into neutral when you are shown images that force you to think about your own death. If you think about other people's death, no problem. But when you are shown these images, to, to basically your brain goes into neutral. Like we are neurologically wired, apparently, to not even believe that we can die. And I think the solution to that, the solution to that kind of delusion is not to be more cheerful. I think we started off with way too much cheer. We've got to come up with something else. And I don't know if doom and gloom will do it. I think you're right. I think people can collapse into whimpering puddles of perspiration. But I don't think being update or upbeat is the answer because I think we're already starting from too upbeat a point. Even though it seems dire, 
We're, it's, I mean, looking at climate change is, is exactly the, the optimists have always been wrong and the pessimists have always been way too optimistic. In virtually every case, what's actually happened with climate change has been worse than the worst case scenarios of just a few years before. Um, so, argue, for, argue to me in favor of being upbeat. This okay. is a great segue okay. to, your, to, <laughs> your, to your topic, I think. Now it gets even more depressing. Um, <laughs> congratulations. Did you see the, the ask they had of, of you? I'm sorry? They had an ask of you. <laughs> I like that earring. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, so. Please. This is an idea actually proposed in a paper by a philosopher called Nick Bostrom, who occupies himself a lot with existential risk. Now, here's the situation. There are technologies that are easy to build and easy to use. And there are technologies that have the capacity for massive destruction. And so far, we've been super lucky that we didn't invent some kind of technology or stumble upon knowledge where those two factors overlap. But this wasn't a conscious decision, we were just lucky. For example, we have atomic bombs and they have capacity, of course, as we've shown, to destroy millions, maybe even half of the world's population. But when we figured out how to harness the energy of the atom, we had the huge luck that it turned out to be a super complicated process. But we couldn't know this up front. It could have also happened, because now only you need a complete nation to build an atomic bomb. But we could have had bad luck, and all you need to you know, set free atomic energy could have been, I don't know, a microwave, a glass of water, and a battery. In that scenario, the default mode of civilization would be instability and destruction. Because every nihilistic, crazy person with an attitude could blow up a city at any time. And we were just super lucky that it's not that easy. But we don't know if future knowledge or future innovations won't have an overlap in those factors. And this is somehow where biotechnology is going. Uh, it's getting easier and easier to design viruses and to make them even more viral than they gotcha. are at the moment, right? Viral, I know it's, it's got a positive image nowadays, but when it comes to bioweapons, it's pretty bad, actually. And, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, what happens if, if we accidentally, you know, bring knowledge in the world um, where the default mode basically would instability and destruction. We have no method of taking knowledge back. We can't do it. So there, there are actually solutions proposed to this, and they are maybe even more terrifying. One solution is... They, they for connect with, um, with Peter's previous suggestions, I think. What, kill all humans? <laughs> so, well, let's call population. it plan B. Dilute the population <laughs> just enough oh, yeah. for it to be manageable. <laughs> yeah, I feel... Yeah, if 2% if, if of the population are idiots, then maybe let's have 100%, 100 people and then we're safe. No, uh, um, so one possibility would be you, you would need to have some kind of switch in case of the appearance of this knowledge that you can basically, yeah, you, you, you pull the switch and the whole world changes instantly into a global policing state to a degree where, you know, with modern technology, basically it is known for every human at any point in time, what they are currently doing with their hands. The other option would be to biologically or chemically remove from people the capacity for mayhem. Um, yeah, I don't know. Choose. <laughs> Some, it's, 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 yeah, Define it's, mayhem, please. Well, uh, let's say nobody for any reason wants to kill millions. Because the, 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 the truth is, I'm absolutely convinced, if you give a red button to a million people and tell them, if you push this button, the other side of the globe will explode. 
you don't have to wait very long <laughs> <laughs> until somebody just wants to know what's going to happen when they're bored, right? <laughs> so it's not a matter of mutual <laughs> destruction. You don't, you don't give... Uh, but if you give the entire population of the entire world that button... Yes which is a mutually assured, collectively assured destruction, you're saying there'll be someone mischievously wanting to press, or trolling to, to press the button. I'm absolutely convinced. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to bring such an we example. We can kill him then. What? Or her. Everybody dies. <laughs> That's the thing. If, you, if anyone pushes the button, I mean, there are people, I know it's a stupid phrase, but they are just interested in seeing the world burn, burn right? If, if you do an, if, if someone runs amok, there's nothing rational about it, right? They want to produce mayhem and they even are willing to pay the price of their own death. Why wouldn't anyone choose to do global amok with whatever technology they have in their hands, if it's easy to do? Of course there would be people I like think this. you're being too optimistic. <laughs> um, now, now you have think, my attention. I, I, think, <laughs> I think what you are describing is something that universally would be agreed as mayhem. You know, the Joker does want to watch the world burn. He knows that, what, that, that the world is burning. That's the point. Mm. I think the problem with a lot of the mayhem that we are currently inflicting on the planet and on each other is that the people doing it don't regard it as mayhem simply being a first world breeder imposes an enormous carbon footprint on the planet, but most people don't think of that as a destructive act. Most people think of it as, you know, the joy of parenthood. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and I've actually spoken to people uh, who, who, you know, smart people sitting in my living room, one of them actually wrote a, yes, <laughs> um, wrote an article in a, an online magazine in, in which he basically hectored us science fiction writers to lighten up. And, you know, no more dystopias, she literally said in italics. Stop writing dystopias. You need to give us solutions. Um, and, of course, the immediate solution is stop having kids, which somehow the hope punks never seem to mention. Um, but she stood in my, in, my, in my kitchen and argued that the solution to climate change was to have more babies. Because... <laughs> When you have more babies, you've got more brains working on the problem. You are not, you are not bringing... This is somebody with a postgraduate degree. This is a US you are not bringing into the, the world millions statement. more, more yeah. carbon belchews who are going to sit on the couch snarfing pork rinds and playing Xbox until the ceiling comes in. No, you are going to raise a whole new generation full of hope and innovation and great ideas to save the world in like 40 or 30 years, assuming any of us are still around then, um, by the time they've grown up and have managed to apply for, for, for grants. These people are well-meaning, but they're distressingly short-sighted. And a lot of the things that, that we consider to be benign are in fact, I think, incredibly destructive. And I think you could take all the red buttons away from everybody. You could have Neural, I mean, hell, Elon Musk is already working on neural implants for everybody. You could have neural Not implants... Not for everybody. Exactly. ...tagged to... Uh, that was another one of my stories, actually. You use the emergency broadcast system in Neuralink to cause all the rich people to kill themselves. Um, there is a, you know, there's a chemical serotonin-based signature for suicidal tendencies, right? So you could... Anyway, that is a... I think, I think, I think we're activating it right now. Yeah. My, my, my point, though, is that... Is that you can actually, you know, even given some miracle technology where you can tell when people are being pernicious and where people want to destroy the world, that's not going to pick up all those cases where people think they're doing the right thing. And they don't, it doesn't occur to them that what our species has done since before we were actually our species is no longer adaptive, that it's actually a bad thing, but it's natural, therefore it must be good. How do you deal with that? This is actually, so obviously we have some box built into a system, right? Uh, that, that there's a philosopher, he's called uh, Julian Savulescu, he calls it um, evolutionary ballast. Things that made a lot of sense in the past, but are the drivers of some of the most crucial problems that we have in the present. For example, the same mechanism that increases your empathy towards people in your in-group, decreases it to the people in the out-group. Oxytocin, for example, if you, if you give 
people oxytocin, they love one another and their children and everything, but also they get more xenophobic. So there is this um, connection of traits that we've seen to not get rid of, um, and we don't know how you, we, we could separate them biologically, uh, that drive many of the problems that we have. And, and maybe there's some point where we could intervene uh, trying to, you know, genetically re-engineer this evolutionary ballast. But, you know, generally speaking, I'm, I'm pretty much pro-human. And uh, <laughs> I think, you know, they're, they're people probably won't stop making children. But, you know, the trend goes globally towards less and less children. So it said we've already peaked the maximum of children per person. And now depends it's... Where. Sorry? I think it depends on... Globally. So, of course, in the West we have, yeah. uh, in Africa we haven't yet, but it's, it's also moving in the same direction. Bear in well, mind that just recently China changed its policy from one child into two children per, per family. That's true. That, but that's going to affect human population. Ooh, we. Yeah, but, but um, it was also shown, you know, we, we, the, we, we, the have, we have figured out what the driving factor is for people to have less children, and it's, for most, it's just the empowerment of women. Female education, yeah. Yes. The moment f women have access to university, to work, etc., they stop making seven, eight children. What a surprise. Uh, the, the wait, 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 wait. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry. This literally means that this is my floor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, where I was born, nowadays in Israel, the majority of um, higher education degrees are given to women. Um, when I went to uni for a, a bachelor, then a master, for a bachelor, we had 80% women in, nice. in, in our class. The thing is, though we are quite patiently waiting for you guys to die out, um, <laughs> we're, still, we're still stuck against this glass door because all of the, the uh, higher ranking or you know, bosses around are still men. So yes, we're, we have more access to education. This is a wonderful thing. This is what I argue for always, but there's need to be an inherent change within order. That's one thing. I'm going to come back to that because, surprisingly, I agree with Peter. Um, <laughs> Ta-da! Um, there, there's, there's something to be said about realizing just how much you're fucking up the universe. And people, out of thinking that they're doing right, are continuing to do this and that and ignore what's actually happening. Um, there is an advantage to humankind acting together, and actually, we're quite smart, and I believe um, very creative, but only in stress situations. Also, you see the best um, described situations of societal behavior when human population is under specific stress. This is described, for example, um, population uh, in London in the 1940s during Second World War have experienced like the best social um, relations when they all had to go down to the tube tunnels and hide from the German bombers and they felt the most community-like. All of a sudden, when you put humankind in stress, they become aware of their situation and respond the way they should respond. Maybe what we're talking about is the need to shake people off. There's a Sartre quote, uh, we've never been more free than under Nazi occupation. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> I you would, guys are from Israel. I would like to. <laughs> the fuck. I, mean, I, I would like to, to suggest that it's not so much the fertility thing that's at issue. Yes, in every place except Africa, and Africa will probably be peaking over the next 20 years or so. Anyway, the number of per capita children are going down, but the fertility rates are lowest. Well, actually, the U.S. is still in the top 10. I think the U.S. is seven in terms of actual population growth. So they not only have greedier mouths, but more of them. But the countries with the lowest birth rates tend to have the highest carbon footprints. When you, if you were to kill a child in Canada, 
you'd be doing far, far more for the environment than if you killed 10 children in Africa. So simply talking about, <laughs> why yes, <laughs> I wonder where that came from. Um, so, so I think it, it might be a bit of a red herring to say all we have to do is, is reduce birth rate and we do this by raising people's standards of living, we do this by empowering women, we do this by giving people more choices. Because the choices people generally make are to increase their standards of living. And if I was, gonna, if I was going to invoke a, a Shirley Jackson style murder lottery to take out, you know, to thin out the herd, I would definitely scale that to carbon footprint so that people who live in first world countries would be like an order of magnitude more likely to get selected for culling than the 50% of the world who breed more than we do but certainly don't have anywhere near the ecological impact. So I think to some extent sheer birth rate doesn't mean much when it's not considered in terms of, of carbon footprint and also in terms of the, the declining mortality rate. So fewer of us living longer can be even more destructive. Are you going to mention the, 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 the UK um, miniseries Utopia? Do we have, does somebody have, oh, I should have, I should have given so them that So clip. it's, um, oh, it's if brilliant. you don't like spoilers, I'm going to spoil the series for you, but um, uh, I'll, I'll try not to, to, to spoil it too much. So it's a miniseries, it's got two seasons and it's about um, an epidemic that goes through the UK. It's a SARS-like epidemic that um, should like erupt throughout the world. And they hand out um, vaccines. And they're the type of vaccines Peter would suggest all of us to have. Uh, but they're, very, they're benign, they're really nice. They just make 90% of men sterile. So, and then there's a second season, to, and, and, and I'm not going to spoil that. But man, those 10% can do the job for all. You won't necessarily... <laughs> I don't think they've handled that question. Well, this is the problem. With even only 10% um, active males, I mean, y technically, you could re-inseminate all of North America with a teaspoon of semen, assuming you were extremely tactical with your distribution of the sperm <laughs> there, right? Um, so, I mean, men are, I, I mean, we are so delicate. a parasitic <laughs> species, like not just metaphorically, but literally. The sperm was originally thought to be, I mean, they were originally, they were gametes, but they were not, it was not, they were not dimorphic. So, and at one point, some, some lineage decided, hey, you know, we could actually, sh we could actually produce more of our, our, our seed if we shrunk down the size, we made them cheaper, and let the other side take up the shortfall, right? So you got this weird bimodal distribution occurring where right now the sperm basically brings nothing except its own DNA and parasitizes the egg. So as a... As a gender, as a species, biologically, we are parasitic. And we are also extremely disposable. You cut the female population in half, because females are always the rarest, the rare sex, because you can get pregnant. When you're pregnant, you can't get pregnant again. You're out of the picture for nine months. We can go on five minutes later and inseminate someone else. So on the one hand, we take... Some of us. Yeah, we, we take very little, you know. <laughs> we've kind of got it made on the, on the one hand, but on the other hand, we are totally overpopulated. Males can... The species would be just fine with like 1% of the males. I think we agree on that. I think we found our <laughs> overpopulation solution. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> well, on the second season, they kind of decide whether it's going to be... Um, random or not. <laughs> uh, yeah. You want to comment? Yeah, go ahead. I was going to move to the next uh, topic. Ah, oh, we have another topic. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, let's, do small. <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add one comment to this entire conversation before I move on to the next uh, topic, which is um, we're talk we've, you've, you've, you've um, mentioned that we're, the, the, there was a discussion that uh, had to do with optimization, with what is um, and with optimizing society, with optimizing humanity, 
And that's a really, really dangerous concept. And I'll, 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 I'll actually, I'll use um, um, Turing tests to kind of suggest something. Um, so I've recently learned about not one, but a number of Turing tests. So we all know the one that you need to kind of figure out if you're talking to a computer or a human. And that would determine if the computer can reenact human qualities. So another two, there were like a number of them, but two that I found interesting is one, w would a computer be able to build an Ikea table? <laughs> and um, would a computer be able to host you in his home for coffee? So you'd knock on the door, he'd need to welcome you, bring you in, um, you know, take uh, two cups off of, off of the top shelf, uh, boil water, pour, put in coffee, da, da da da. Ask you how you like your coffee. There are different types of people don't uh, align with passing these Turing tests. <laughs> <laughs> and um, from infants to people who are impolite, to people who don't care, to people who may be uh, may not be able to reach the door. All right, um, may, may be hearing impaired, they may be um, uh, like the ability to walk. So it's um, human beings are extremely diverse and that's one trait of humanity that um, is very dangerous to kind of, when you start talking about optimization, you go in, there's a slippery slope that we've been through in the, in the, 20, in the, pa in the, in the past 100 years that's problematic. But moving on, <laughs> Alice, you want to you wanna say something? Um, well, I, I, I'm sort of torn between disagreeing with you and, and, and agreeing with you profoundly. Um, in the sense that, I mean, I think you're writer than you know. It, you, you don't have to be short, you don't have to be hearing impaired to not pass certain Turing tests. After the, um, you know, these, these chat bots that have been seeding the, the news sphere with, with various types of propaganda, um, various bits of analysis have started to show that, in fact, there's a paper that came out just a couple of months ago that basically says that human beings are not artificial general intelligences. We are not sapient entities when we're not concentrating on things. Um, that the quality, uh, that, that, that the, the attempts to try and look at social media and filter out what's generated by a bot and what's generated by a human being might be a lost cause because most of the time, human beings are behaving in a way that's indistinguishable from bots in terms of the level of their comprehension. In terms of, and, you know, professors weigh in and they say, yeah, we've got these second order correlation essays that are being written where they obviously don't know what they're talking about, but it sounds plausible, it sounds smooth, it's written in the style I gave them, it uses the right, this is how we function. So, yes, people would frequently fail Turing tests. <laughs> but I disagree in the sense that, that in the first place, not being able to reach a doorknob because you're too short is, there's an obvious hearkening to, well, we want people to be tall, we want to, we're, you're, you're basically talking obviously about kind of eugenics optimization. I'm talking about something that would hobble everyone on a sort of a, let's destroy the planet level. Something that would, something that would make us less greedy, not something that would make people not something that would allow you to ostracize people because they're the wrong height, but just something that would make people less driven to consume. I, I, that wouldn't even be, I mean, Martin Rose ra raised a really good point earlier when he was talking about what constitutes an optimization. This would not be an optimization I'm talking about because in a Darwinian sense, reducing your consumption, reducing your own fitness is a bad thing. So this would not be an optimization. Well, you, but I think it would be good for the species and it would be good for the planet. I, I you give one, uh, in your talk, you gave one example of one potentially all-inclusive optimization, which is intelligence. Yes. Mm. But I, I don't even know if we have to change biology to increase intelligence or, or, or change biology to Could act you, more. You're setting up my, my, my thing. It's Do good. I? Oh, yeah. brilliant. Uh, I'll try to keep it short, but maybe, you know, <laughs> If the machine can do it better than the human, maybe all we know is more 
reliance on the machine. Uh, and we don't have to force this. Think about this. If you roughly know where you want to go, but Google Maps shows you a different route, you think, ah, Google Maps is smarter. I would be stupid to not listen to Google Maps. Nobody forces you to do this, right? You roughly trust the Tinder algorithm to find the attractive people for you, right? You don't question this. And maybe if we manage to make the AI in a, man, in, in, in a matter that it makes better decisions and we couldn't ignore forever that those decisions are better than, ones, uh, than the ones that we would do, we would automatically tend to, to uh, do what the AI says, right? We wouldn't have to be forced to do what the machine said. We would notice for ourselves that this is the better decision because obviously we are flawed. Um, and so, so maybe we, we have to change nothing. We just need to become more dependent. Just important point to add to that. Having AI, having all this vast information produced for us, is one thing. The decision-making, I argue, has to be our own. We had a previous discussion, Uwe and I, about the same thing, um, AI aiding a justice system, for example. So analyzing immense amount of information, this is exactly what robots are there for. This is um, complex calculations, point clouds, what have you. This is what they're good at, and we're not. But the final decision? But that's we're terrible. That's we're no, terrible no, no, in no, the no, decision. No, a final terrible, decision I mean. that has to do with morality, a final decision that has to do with what's right. How often can you teach a machine to do that? How can you stop a machine from being manipulated by another? When you're talking about this kind of centrality, having another person manipulating that is just... How are any of these arguments not applicable to humans, though, and to they an even greater are, extent? But then we're jumping onwards to rather preparing all that data for you, and you make a best decision according to a scenario, rather than, ah, I'm a human, I, I suck. Your decision is yours, and it's in the moment you made it, and it, you might regret it later, but it's the optimal decision for you at the moment. Always. Yeah. And but then, um, if you could maybe add the points we were talking about in, in relating to the justice system. To the justice system, well, I... I, I it's on every layer. You don't need to go to killer drones, which is an obvious, huge dilemma. Um, let's go. Um, let's go on a road trip. Okay. Let's let's use Waze or Google to map our way from one place to another. Um, you would there's you would claim that there's an optimal um, route from point A to point B. I would claim that people, once they've noticed that you know. 50 out of 51 times Google shows you a better road than if you go the one that you intended, you will automatically choose to trust in Google. But that's so, biased. Um, let's talk about architecture in a moment. But mm -hmm. um, Google might show you the shortest way um, uh, or the cheapest way. But what if you want to take a country road and look at the, uh, you know, at the foliage? But what if you want the slow road um, um, to, uh, you know, to, to go through a process with your, uh, you know, partner. This is just insufficient information. Let's take it one step further. Mm -hmm. You put an, I don't know, electrode into your brain. That's a stupid analogy. But so the machine yeah, yeah, yeah. notices which path that you're taking evokes the most joy in you. And it Lovely. notices that whenever you drive beside a river or through a mountain, this is where you feel okay. best, right? And then you tell the machine, I want to have the nicest, sweetest way to point B, do it. So the best way is the way that's most enjoyable? You need some readout, or, or, or you say where I'm the most, I don't know. Uh, Isn't the I most think enjoyable you can be um, how you would um, uh, post-factum characterize your trip? But you could have a star system, simply. You don't even need the electrode. This was an amazing route. Thank you, Google. Ne next time, choose a similar so, one. But, um, so when, let's say I do this trip and uh, it, w it went well, but mm. uh, a day later I might say, no, it didn't go as planned. We should have taken a different 
a lot, you know, a longer time, or uh, we need, we should have gone through that town, mm -hmm. or we should have visited Aunt Betsy. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, optimization is dependent on the moment. There's no general optimization. That's kind of what I... And uh, there's uh, a lot to be said about chance and chance occurrences, but I'm not sure if we have a lot of time left we are, we are for the, we have no time for the conversation. So we'll just have to come back next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, any final words? I don't know. Uh, from each. Can I be the last? Because you're going to be like super... Let's kill everyone. You know oh, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I am going to yield my time to you. You can talk twice as long. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna give like, um, because we had like one more topic, which is my, my topic. Do it. But it's it was really interesting. One. So yeah. I'm, I'm just, um, my thing would be uh, the perception of the future, and uh, because we don't, we, 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 we don't perceive reality. We don't, we don't. Um, we don't uh, uh, go through reality, we perceive reality. And we perceive reality through stories, and through myths, and through legends. And when I say stories, I mean uh, both artistic and political. Um, uh, stories can be books and films, and they can be political speech and journalism, and they can, th and they can be national anthems. Those are all stories. And Yuval Noah Harari, uh, bringing up my countrymen, another story. Um, he claims in Sapiens um, that, the m that myths are the true separator between humans and the rest of the natural world. Uh, that our ability to speculate and hypothesize and convey imaginary concepts to one another through language is where, this is a quote from his book, history declared its independence from biology and it's what enabled Sapiens to cooperate in extremely flexible ways with countless numbers of strangers. That's why sapiens rule the world, whereas ants eat our leftovers and chimps are locked up in zoos and research lab laboratories. And the stories we tell about the future shape our perception of the future and affect our actions towards the future. And I would claim to you, we need a plethora of stories about the future. And dystopias are important as they contain within them the possibility of a future, just thinking about the future, and also can um, allow us the time, hopefully necessary, to avert certain disasters or certain cataclysms, cataclysms. But we need a plethora of ideas about the future. So I would look, I'm, I'm looking at you, but I'm looking at everybody here, you know, start thinking about, continue thinking about the future and maybe write a few short science fiction stories. <laughs> and, and have it the future you want, because it's super, it's delicious to think about the terrible things that are just being around the corner, right? It's, it, it's exhilarating, it's exciting, it's terrifying, and it's so easy to, well, get caught up in it. But with that in mind, and it's important to have that in mind, what we want for ourselves should be better, and not as a way of, you know, a good a good night story so you can go back and, you know, have a beer and forget about what was being said here and feel better about yourself. No, the opposite. To motivate you to do better, to realize that we've fucked up this planet and we have a lot to be accounted for and action needs to be done. So maybe have not only bad stories but good stories in, in, in the sense of what you want to happen and then strive for that. Are we cool with that? Yeah. All right. Martin, have something to say?